Okay, I want to go ahead and welcome, welcome you all to um, this talk with Emily Ike, and Emily is here um, representing her former position as the attendant to Miss Indian Arizona, which is an ambassador position that represents the 22 federally recognized tribes that reside within the state of Arizona. Um, additionally, she is going to go ahead and share some information with you about various Native American tribes. As you can see, she's already kind of set up for you guys. Um, uh, here in the Southwest, so she's going to show you her traditional talent, which involves how to dye wool using plants from her family's home on the Navajo Reservation. And we are very grateful to have you here. Again, I'm Gina Desai. I'm the Cultural Diversity Coordinator here at GCC. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome you here to Glendale Community College. And these are my wonderful students, and I'm very, very glad that they are here as well. Testing. Okay. <clears throat> Such a big room. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Ike, and thank you so much, Gina, for introducing me. Um, she's actually really good friends with my mom and asked me to come out this morning to give a presentation to all of you. Uh, so, just a little bit about myself. Um, I would like to first introduce you in my traditional language. So, Yat E Abine, She E Emily Ike Ki Ani Nishle, Vietnamese E Bashish Chin, Kin Klichini E Dashiche, Vietnamese E Dashinala. Uh, so I said, hello, my name is Emily Ike. And the way that my tribe, the Navajo tribe, uh, sort of introduces ourselves is we have a clan system. So we have four clans. And the first one goes by uh, your maternal, your mother's clan, so I am Towering House. And then the second one is your father's clan, which my dad is actually Vietnamese, so I'm mixed. Uh, so I'm also Vietnamese. And then my maternal grandfather's clan is Red House. And then finally, my paternal grandfather is Vietnamese. So just a little bit about myself. Usually whenever um, I go out into the community, um, it's always good to introduce yourself by your clans because this is how we identify who we're related to, or at least where our families come from. And a little bit more about my family. As I told you all that I'm actually mixed. So my grandmother immigrated from Vietnam back in the 70s, and she met my grandfather. Uh, that's how they had my dad. And then on my mom's side of the family were actually from Wide Ruins, Arizona. So about Flagstaff, two hours east of there is where my family's home is. Uh, so they had my mom and my mom and my dad met in Tupa City. So yeah, a little bit about my family history. Um, and luckily Gina was able to tell you a little bit about my position as an ambassador. So with my mixed heritage, and at least with, uh, within Native American communities, we have what are called like ambassador positions or like pageantry. And I'm sure in your guys' head, when you think of pageantry, you think of um, what you see on TV, where you have to like look super, super in shape, like the swimsuit categories, interview categories. And pretty much we, within our Native communities, we have developed pageantry. Um, but instead, we have incorporated our cultural teachings and our language. So instead of a swimsuit category, we have a traditional talent category, we have interviews, we have a speech that we also have to give in front of an audience. Uh, so it's very much tailored to showing off our traditional skills and what we, uh, how we represent our communities. Uh, so that's just a little bit about pageantry and how I've been, uh, gotten involved and been, been able to give back to my community. Uh, so a, a really big thing that I really enjoy sharing too is my mixed heritage. Uh, so I think that people who have mixed backgrounds have a really beautiful way of just understanding both worlds. And so I really take my position seriously of just trying to represent and uh, just kind of be a leader for young girls who um, you know, want to show their culture, want to learn their culture, and just want to you know, understand if they're coming from mixed backgrounds, you know, how to find that balance. Uh, so a little bit about that side of me, which I'll be sharing, yeah, uh, one of my talents, which is how to naturally dye wool. So I'll go into that in a little bit. But I definitely wanted to start off with more of an interactive activity today. Um, I'm also a student too, so I try to, I, I don't want to lecture at you guys because <laughs> I know how it feels. Um, but yeah, a little bit more on the other side of my life. Um, I actually graduated from NAU with a degree in psychology 
And right now I'm actually working my master's at ASU in program evaluation and data analytics. So I work full time as a data analyst at ASU's Teachers College. Um, and I also used to work as a finan financial aid advisor for a good year and a half. So at the end of the presentation, if you guys do have any questions about ASU, even financial aid, I'm more than more, more than happy to help answer your questions. So, um, but yeah, I have, I've taken a couple classes here at the community college back when I was in high school. So a little, little familiar with the campus, but it's really good to be here today. Um, so as I just stated, I kind of put together a short activity for all of us and to sort of have you guys get a little bit more excited. I was able to bring some, some prizes along too uh, for each of the teams. So I just brought some like simple candy uh, and a Pendleton blanket and I also have two, um, two other bags of candy. So I think what I'm going to do, I also have two $10 Starbucks gift cards. So I think what I want to do, if anyone wants to volunteer to try a crack at it by yourself, then I'll, I'll give you the $10 Starbucks gift card. So is there one person at this table that would like to try? You get a free Starbucks, you get like two drinks out of it. <laughs> okay, perfect. Is there someone at this table that would like to try it as well? <laughs> I'm going to give it to you either way if you just try it. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, and if I, I can also ask that no one, you, you know, looks it up on their phone. So uh, first I'm just going to have each individual just try and take a crack at it. So what I want you to do is a map of Arizona. Uh, each of those little pieces of paper are each of the 22 federally recognized tribes. So if you can try and place on the map where they're at or where their reservations are at, just try. Yeah, and if anyone wants to look at it too. <laughs> Yeah, once you guys try, I'll give you all your Starbucks gift card, and then I'm going to have each group take a crack at it, too. So and whoever does get the most correct placements, y'all can share a bunch of bags of candy. <laughs> yeah, so a little bit about just the different tribes. Um, this past year, as first attendant to Miss Indian Arizona, so with that position, um, when we compete, it, it's a maximum of two individuals per tribe can compete for the state title. Um, and so when I competed, there was a total of eight contestants, uh, two from Navajo Nation, which I was one of. We had some from Salt River, Gila River. Um, let me think where else. Oh, San Carlos, White Mountain Apache as well. So, but as I was in this ambassador position for an entire year, uh, we're able to travel and go into all these events and go into each single community. And a lot of us have our treaty days, we have cultural events where we share stories and food. And each of these tribes we have, um, in each region there are some similarities, but each of these tribes are very, very unique. Uh, so I am from the Navajo tribe, which I'll see if you guys are able to, I, I feel very confident that you guys would be able to know where our reservation is, because we are, we do have the largest reservation in the United States. <laughs> Try not to put any pressure, but, but yeah, so usually this past year serving as my ambassador position, I was definitely traveling and going to each of these different communities throughout the year. So very, very beautiful culture, very different, but it's always really great to learn. doing over here.
Perfect. I'm just going to give you guys 30 seconds. All right, time's up. I'm going to ask you guys to stop. Thank you. <laughs> just because next I'm going to have the entire tables help you all out. Let me see over here how many you got right. Let's see. <laughs> Let me see. Where am I? OK, this one was close. We got one, two. I'll give this one to you. Nah, yeah, I'll give that one to you. Okay. Three. All right, you got three correct. Nice. All right, let's see over here. All right. Awesome. Yeah, I'll give you Salt River, Gila River, Prescott, and Tonto Apache. All right, so you got four correct. Nice. All right, nice job. I mean, either way, great job. You guys still earned the Starbucks gift card. I'm really, thank you guys for stepping up. I really appreciate it. <laughs> All right, so next, I'm going to have both tables kind of collaborate together. So if you guys want to help um, in whichever table does get the most correct, you can have all of the candy that I brought today. Perfect. Yeah, so if you guys can start trying to work as a team and try and place as many. <laughs> These two. Yeah, and those. Yep. Hmm? Have a soup eye? Okay. I guess just to be nice, I could probably give both of you guys the chance to ask me two questions. Perfect. And do you guys need to want me to tell you which ones you did get correct? Yeah. Okay. So you got this one. I'll give you this one. And then, yeah, and those three. Yeah, so just those three. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Yeah, and just let me know when you guys feel confident. You guys are doing pretty good, though. <laughs> I'm trying to think of, like, a good tip to give you guys. Like, I would say, like, look at the seals and see if that might give you a hint of where that is in Arizona. But honestly, they're kind of vague, so I don't think that's a good advice. Yeah, I'll give you guys. You guys can have the chance to ask me two questions if you want. No, yeah. Monument Valley is. You guys know like the old road, like old films or um, Forrest Gump when he's like running in Monument Valley. That's on the map formation. So if you know where Monument Valley is. <laughs> Forrest Gump or Monument Valley? Oh, I feel like. <laughs> and then Peach 
Oh, Hopi? Oh, Wallapai? I gave them two tips. So Wallapai, that one is where the, um, the Skywalk is. Do you guys know where that's at? On your way to Vegas? Okay, that's too big of a hint, but I'll, I'll give it to you guys. <laughs> and then, yeah. And then the same tip that I gave them about the Navajo Nation is, I, mean, I know you guys have seen Forest Gump where Monument Valley is. That's on my reservation. Do you guys know Monument Valley? Where he's like running and it's really pretty with like the red rocks. Okay, let me give a different tip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're, you're like good in the general vicinity. You're on the right track. You're in the correct area of, of Arizona. <laughs> if you guys don't mind if I can take a picture. Because I like, I'm very proud I put these together. <laughs> I was like cutting them and drawing it last night. Thanks. <clears throat> What's going on? Did we get it? Which one? <gasps> what about all these ones? <laughs> I gave you guys, let's see. I gave you a hint for Wallapai where it's where the beautiful falls are and where the skywalk is on your way to Las Vegas. I think that gives you a good, no, for Wallapai with the two women's faces, yeah. Mm -hmm. And same with Havasupai, that's where the really pretty turquoise falls are. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the other team is just about done placing all of theirs, so we can just take a crack at it. Just try placing them somewhere. Help some help with the computer. Can I get some help with the computer? Thank you. I just want to. 
pull up a map so that way I can. Yeah, so I just put this in. Oh, apologies. Okay, cool. I'm pulling up a map that way I can pull it up here so you guys can see. <laughs> see if I can find. This is fine. This will do. <laughs> all right. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna like hold y'all accountable, so that way you can tell me which ones that you got. But we'll start from the top down. So we have the Kaibab Paiute tribe. So I believe that's the one with the black and white seal. So if someone can also keep track of like how many you have correct as well. That would be great. And then over here on the other side of page. We have the San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe. And then this entire area is the Navajo Nation. So, how much fun fact, yeah, our reservation is the biggest reservation in the United States. Perfect. And then I guess a bit of a trick question, but the Hopi Tribe does reside within our reservation boundaries as well. So, and then finally over here on the other side of page, this one was a little tricky. When I was first learning, I would get them flipped, but we have the Havasupai tribe, which that's, when I was giving you guys a hint, that's where the, like, the turquoise waterfalls are, and where that really beautiful hike is, is at. And then to the left of them, we have the Wallapai tribe, and that's where you have like the skywalk. So when I gave you all a hint of like on your way to Vegas, usually when you're headed over there, um, I believe it's like one of the exits that you can go and visit. So, all right, finally moving down to the middle of Arizona, we have all the way on the right side, the Pueblo of Zuni, which I think, I don't think any of you guys got that one. <laughs> but, and then finally moving over, yeah, we have the Yavapai Apache Nation, which is out over in Camp Verde, Arizona. And then over in Prescott, we have the Yavapai Prescott Tribe. So I'm proud, I know all, both, both teams got that. Awesome. And then moving over on the other side, we have the Fort Mojave Indian Tribe, which I think you guys were pretty close. Awesome. All right, so moving down, we have over in Payson, the Tonto Apache Tribe. And then on the east side of Arizona, we have White Mountain Apache, which that's where like Pine Top is. And then just below is San Carlos Apache Tribe as well. Yeah. And so then here within Phoenix, we have Salt River, um, Salt River Pima Maricopa tribe. So if you guys have been over to like the Odyssey Aquarium, um, trying to think some of the shopping areas like Talking Stick Resort, that's all on Salt River reservation lands. And then if you go up north where Fountain Hills is, that's actually Fort McDowell Yavapai Nation. So that's here in Phoenix. And then also just below south of to the 202, that's the start of the Gila River, um, Gila River Indian community. And that stretches like pretty much like halfway down, all the way down to like Casa Grande, right mom? Okay. <laughs> and then finally moving over here, we have the Colorado River Indian tribes. So that's placed over where like Parker, Arizona is. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever been to like Lake Havasu City, so it's just south of there. All right, moving down, we'll kind of stay on the, on the west side of Arizona. So we have the Fort Yuma uh, Quechon tribe. And then just below is the Cocopa tribe as well. So, on which the Cocopa tribe also shares uh, a border with Mexico as well. So their tribe has, um, they're able to cross uh, across the border. Since all of these borders and these reservations, like back then, we didn't we didn't go by maps. There wasn't any sort of borders of that way. So things were a little bit more free between communities and families to be able to move across state lines and uh, international lines as well. So, uh, okay, all right, we're almost done. So yeah, just south of Gila River is we have Auction as well. So if you put that below Gila, you would have gotten that correct. And then going all the way down in the Tucson area, we have the Thana Otham Nation and Pascua Yaki Tribe. So awesome, I believe. 
believe that's all of them. I can't think of it. All right, let me, I'm gonna come around and check. All right, let's see who got. Oh, did you guys move them around? I would say you got that one. One, two. I'll be nice and give that to you guys. I'll be. Let's see. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right. Yeah. Nine, ten. I don't know if I counted that one. How many did you say? Okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> nice job, guys. All right, do you guys move any of them? Oh, you guys already placed them all in the correct order. Did any of you guys keep track of how many you guys were able to get correct the first time around? Ten? Well, it sounds like both teams got 10, so I will just split the bag of candy equally between y'all. <laughs> Let's see. Um, I'll let y'all choose. All right, I guess I'll just have to choose between y'all. All right, so if you guys want, feel free to like open these up and you can grab as much candy as you want to split. Yeah, here you guys go. Enjoy. And if you guys aren't a fan of chocolate, I do have sweet tart candy canes. I'm not a huge chocolate person, so yeah, come if you just want to pass it around. But yeah, if you don't want chocolate, you can grab that. So cool. All right. Awesome. I'm actually I'm thinking about what I, how I could <sighs> trying to think. <laughs> <laughs> I think, okay, I'm thinking of like a last minute activity. If one of you guys wants to ta take a crack at trying to name as many tribes as you can off the top of your head and whoever can name the most, I'll gift the Pendleton blanket to y'all. Does that sound good? All right, let me see if I can. I think all of you guys got adequate time to be able to think about. Thank you. this over to my mom. I'll do our last activity so I can give away the blanket. Whoever wants to come up and take a crack at trying to name as many tribes as you can off the top of your head. I think I've like tested myself too. I think I, I think I can do it. All right. Phones are off, that is off. <laughs> All right, let me just pull up a list that way. I can. Okay, one moment, who wants to go first? <laughs> Mom, you're supposed to cover them up. <laughs> Who would like to go first? Anyone at this table? <laughs> Did you want to try? Um, no, it doesn't have to be the full correct name, but if I can, if I like know, like Fort Mojave, that would be fine. Yeah, or like Kilo River, yeah. You want to go first? Okay, that's fine. <laughs>
San Carlos, San Juan, White Mountain. Um, is it Hoppy? San Carlos, San Juan, White Mountain. White Mountain. Um, is it Hopi? Um, we got Fort McDowell. Yep. Um, AK. I don't know how to pronounce it. It's AK. Um, something. Jin. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Can you even give me the other one? Uh. Is it the Colorado River? Um, what's another one? How many y'all got? Five? I know you from up past Flagstaff. Um, you said a lot of tribes that you were from. Vietnamese. <laughs> she said she was Vietnamese. <laughs> um, hey. And it's like a Pima tribe. Like, No, you did really well, though. Yeah, you did really well. All right. Who wants to take a crack at this table? We got, she, she was able to get six. Six, which is like really good. You want to try? Give me the microphone. Okay. Um, the Navajo Nation, Gila Bend, Hopi, right? Hopi? Um, Colorado River. I'm already going through. <laughs> yeah, I can't go far. The Gila Bend, um, San Juan. Oh, Apache something. Oh, I don't know. The <laughs> 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 <Yeah>, all <four. laughs> um, I literally had more and I'm blinking. Okay, give up. Can I name her five and then keep going? Okay, I don't say five. All right. All right, so we got. Um, so we got Hopi, Colorado River, uh, Navajo. Um, ah, there's one in Prescott. Ah, I'm blanking on it. Um, oh, why am I blanking on the name? You literally just did it. 
We literally just did it. No, I'm, I'm like picturing the map. I'm picturing the map in my head. Um, oh, why am, so how many do I, I got four? Um, Did I get Heal the River? Oh, five. Word, word. Um, Fima Maricopa. And then. And. And. Yuma. Yuma. There's one on the Grand Canyon, too. I guess I'm not in there. Okay, so there's the, was it the Colorado River? Um, Havasupai, the Pima. Um, okay, I don't know that one. Fort McDowell, Salt River, Gila River, San Juan, San Carlos, and Navajo. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, hold on. Did I say the 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 Payson. Payson is a city. Yeah, we don't have to. But they are. I don't know. Is anyone else going to go? Is anyone going to get to try after this? 
Um, oh, White Mountain. Oh, okay. And um, uh, the one on the way to Vegas. Girl, what the name will be. <laughs> Okay. Did you want to try or you good? All right, well, congratulations. You got a total of nine correct. Here you go, you have earned it. Which I really do want to say, like, you guys did a really good job at naming all of them. So usually when I, like, work with other students or ask questions, people can only name, like, one or two tribes. So um, you guys did a really, really good job with, like, six, five. Um, so I'm, I'm really proud of you guys. It makes me very happy. Um, normally, if we had more time, I would take a, a crack at it to like try and see if I can name off all 22. I've done it like a couple times, but it's been a while. So, but pretty much, what I wanted to teach you guys through this activity was just to be aware of like how many different tribes are just within the state of Arizona. There's 22. Technically, almost going to be 23 because another tribe is trying to be federally recognized. Um, so, and with that, just understanding just the diversity and just how many tribes are located within the state of Arizona, as well as just trying to understand, you know, where, where they're located within throughout our state. Um, and as I was kind of saying before, a lot of these tribes are really diverse. So depending on which location that their tribes are located in Arizona, you know, they're very based off of living off of the rivers, agriculture, um, up on the Navajo reservation, we have our sheep and grazing and cattle. Um, so just a lot of really beautiful tribes, and as you can tell with all the different uh, types of weather throughout the state of Arizona, that also translates to our traditional attire as well. So, uh, but yeah, and some of the tribes I really would like to really state, especially since all of us live within the city of Phoenix, is we have Salt River, which is over in Scottsdale area, Fort McDowell, and then just south of here we have Auction and Gila River. So if you guys kind of just like, as you're sort of like, driving on the freeway, you'll see um, as you enter reservation lands, you'll see their signs of the seals that you just saw today. You'll see it, so just keep an eye out. And I think usually how I like to tell people a good rule of thumb of knowing whether or not you're on reservation land is if you can see a casino, you're on reservation land. That's the ancestral lands of a tribe or a community here. Um, so try and keep, hmm? Oh, it's just a good rule of thumb because for casinos, they can, they have, they can only operate on uh, tribal lands, on reservation lands. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There are some exceptions to it, but a good rule of thumb is if you see a casino, you're on reservation land. So yeah, you, you can think of that. When I'm traveling, you know, you'll see an exit off the, si off the side of the road. Um, that's usually a tribe. So just keep an eye out. There's a lot of us, and I think you'll be surprised at just how many different communities are actually here within the state of Arizona. So, cool. Any questions so far about the activity? I know I don't have too much time left, but I wanted to share at least a traditional talent or traditional knowledge from my tribe and, and anything, but any questions, comments? Cool, awesome. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Great, all right, so. As I just said, each of these tribes is very well known for like beadwork, weavings, basketry. In my tribe, uh, one of the things that we are known for is for our silversmithing and our jewelry. So as you guys can see my attire, I have my squash blossom um, and my earrings, and these are called cluster style. Uh, so this is a very common, well-known you know, style of jewelry that my tribe uh, wears. So it took me like, Took me a really long time to save up, but usually when you receive jewelry, it's passed down to you from your family, so like generations, and you just have some really, really beautiful heirloom pieces. Uh, but this one I've gotten, I uh, was able to save up for it and purchase this past year. So I, you know, when I have my own kids and grandkids in the future, they'll have, um, I'll be able to pass this down to them, which makes me really happy. Um, but another thing uh, that we were well known for is our weaving. So I'm sure all of you guys, if you've, you know picture the Navajo tribe, you can imagine our weavings and our sheep. So traditionally our communities, and even now, um, my grandmother, she still keeps like 10 or 15 sheep. Um, I even have some friends that during the summertime and when they were in college, they would go home and help uh, just take care of the sheep as well. So sheep not only provides us food, but it also provides us uh, materials like wool that we create into our weavings. 
And a little bit about my family. So my Masana, that's how I call her, my grandmother, my maternal grandfather, or grandmother. Um, back when she was younger, and my aunts and my uncles and my moms were still growing up, so back when they're like just born all the way until be like 10, 12 years old, this was back when we still had like the trading post open. And my, my grandmother actually had to do weavings to be able to provide for our family. So just be able to put groceries or get food or put food on the table. She would weave these very intricate weavings. And I've seen pictures of them. Unfortunately, she did have to sell them to the trading posts. Um, but there are some weavings where she's done where it's the size of a piece of paper. And I've also seen pictures of weavings where they're even taller than I am. So she's done some really beautiful large pieces of work. Um, and to this day, you know, even though she did have to sell them to take care of our family, I always kind of keep an eye out if I see any of them or her signature um, at any of these trading posts. So when I, I guess as I'm sharing this knowledge with you, I really just want to give you guys an idea of just how important it is. It, this knowledge and this, these teachings aren't just art. They were very integral to the survival of my family and for me to even be here today, to be here to go to school and just, you know, um, uh, and just work on my career. So I'm, I'm really happy that's something really important that I just really wanted to share with you guys so you can kind of understand the importance behind um, this skill and this knowledge. So just a little bit more, more in like to the technical stuff. Um, I really enjoy plants. I really enjoy uh, hiking and rock climbing. So uh, this is kind of how I just dove into this skill was I just really enjoy being outside. I really enjoy learning about medicine and the different plants that are located here in Arizona, as well as wanting to sort of learn my mother's, uh, my grandmother's craft and keep it going. Uh, so that's kind of how it incorporated her weaving and her wool and my love for plants. So usually when we shear our sheep, which is during the spring, um, you know, we'll take all of their wool and then we have to clean it. So usually there's a lot of um, uh, like fat and oil. So usually we bury it so that way the sand will sort of soak it up and then we clean it uh, just using regular soap. And then after that, we have to use what's called a carding um, tool to be able to card uh, the sheep's wool. So that way you can get the fibers instead of all being jumbled up to be sort of parallel to each other. And so the next step after that, as you can see right here, you'll kind of get these like clumps of carded wool. And then after that, this is when we start spinning it into yarn. And so this is a traditional style of spinning. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen like the bigger like spinning machines, but this is how we do it. And so pretty much you're just sitting down and you hold this side on the floor and then you sort of like roll it on your thigh. And so, yeah, so as you can kind of see, I've been like working on it. I'm learning right now. I'm not the best at it. So, but yeah, so ended up coming from like more of a tuft of wool and this is how we get our, our string. So, and if you guys want, you can pass this around. There you go, you can just pass it around, thank you. So, and once that's finished, this is where it comes in of my dyeing. And I'll probably just put a couple of, of them at each table so you guys can take a look. But I'll just name like a couple of the items that I've dyed with. But all of this wool has been naturally dyed and I also forage for all of the plant materials as well myself. So I would say like four of these colors, it probably took me about 40 hours of work um, just to be able to collect the plants. <laughs> yeah, so let's see, I'll give you guys and then I'll kind of explain and go through each color. Yeah. There you go. All right, see, so yeah, I'll go into a little bit of the details about dyeing wool. So I'll start off by how I collect the plants. Uh, there's a bunch of different colors there. I believe the dark olive green ones, those ones were uh, dyed using juniper. Juniper, uh, the branches and the leaves. Oh yeah, I gave them some as well. And then finally, um, this sort of like 
uh, sort of like dusty yellow color. This one was dyed using, what was it, um, rabbit's brush. So if you guys have ever been up into Flagstaff and you see those really big bushes with yellow flowers on it, that's rabbit's brush, which is this one. And then we also have another plant called Navajo tea as well, and that was this really bright yellow one was dyed using that. And it's just usually these really tall, um, tall stalks with little yellow flowers on top. And we also make like tea, so it also has some medicinal uses as well. And then finally, with this blue one, this one I was actually dyed using black beans, so I was kind of just trying that out. So people usually dye using like scraps of onions or even avocado <coughs> peels too. And then finally, this sort of like pink one, yeah, the pink one over there, this one was dyed using prickly pear, just the fruit of the cacti. Cool, and this is actually a new one that I did where I forgot, it, it's called pine drop, but um, it was just a new type of plant that I tried out this past month. So that one gave off a tan color. <coughs> yeah, so once I've collected the plants, and also there's a specific way of collecting, um, so, a key piece of knowledge that my grand grandmother gave me is every single time that I would collect or I guess take from the land, it's always respectful to give something back. So when I go out and I you know, harvest the prickly pear or harvest the juniper, I always <coughs> carry with me corn pollen. And so usually every time I do, I take a moment before I take anything and I gift corn pollen and give a little prayer. Um, and I think, you know, that's how I go about being respectful and sort of uh, giving thank you to the land. And you guys don't have to carry corn pollen, but I would like to just share that, that teaching that my grandmother gave me, that if you guys are ever outside or, um, you know, anytime you're taking from the land, maybe just say a quick prayer, just at least just acknowledge, you know, what the land gives to us. And I think that's really what I would want you to take home. So, but the next process is there are two main methods of dyeing wool. So there's the boiling method and there's a fermentation method. And so with the boiling, pretty much um, you use, you get the plants and you boil it in water for like two to four hours. And then after that, you have to add uh, a sort of chemical or powder to make sure that the dye really adheres to the wool. You don't have to use the chemical powder, but it really helps provide some of these like really vibrant colors. Because anytime you're dying naturally, it kind of, uh, the color sort of, um, it kind of just dulls a little bit. So alum, um, iron, those are all some examples of different like chemical powders you can put in there. And then after that, I you know take all of the plants out, and then I put in my wool, and then I let that boil for another two to four hours, and then I let it sit overnight. So that's just the boiling method. Um, try to really give you a quick summary. Um, I would say the reason why I consider it a talent is because just like cooking, you know, when you can follow a recipe and it can kind of turn out, but there are just little things like, oh, maybe you need to add a little bit more of the spice or, you know, just understanding like the quality of the food items that you're using to really create something beautiful. And so as that relates to wool, I have to think about, you know, the pH levels of the water. I have to think about how much plants I'm using and also where I harvested the plants and what time of year I harvested the plants. So there's like all these little things. And even from year to year, if I collect from the same tree the next year, the color might turn out different. Um, so yeah, so it's like a science and I really enjoy it. Yeah, so now the next step, um, pretty much what I've been working on is getting all of my colors ready. And so my next step would be weaving. So I would re weave a rug out of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I just bought my first loom. Uh, so I actually do plan to go home and learn from my grandmother. So I, I am still learning. Um, and it's gonna take uh, at least a few months for me be, to be able to learn. Because when we weave, we have traditional stories and we have traditional songs that are, um, I guess, just associated with every single piece of the loom and how you set up the loom. So if you guys can think of just the amount of intention, the amount of like generational stories that have been handed down, um, this craft is just, there's a lot of time and a lot of love and a lot of effort uh, put into it. So yeah, so that's it. That's all I wanted to share with you guys. I, yeah, really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. If you guys have any questions, um, I'll come around. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Can you just tell us, like, if we wanted to dye the yarn, what exactly would they have to do? Yeah. So. Um, Dying wool isn't just just for 
this traditional outfit is heavily influenced from when the Spanish uh, came up to Arizona, and we did a lot of trading with them. Um, so that's where we sort of got this three-tiered style. But our traditional wear, which is called a bith, uh, is a rug dress. So we would weave two big like squares and we would pretty much just sew them together and we would like leave holes for the arms. Uh, but that was our traditional, traditional attire. Um, and then yeah, a little bit about my outfit, I'm also wearing my moccasins as well. So as you guys could see where the Navajo Nation is like up in the northern region of Arizona, it gets very, very cold and there's a lot of like harsh, like prickly pa uh, plants up there. So we wear moccasins because these help protect our feet from the cold and from just the harsh environment. So uh, the soles of my shoes are made with cowhide, and the tops are red leather. And the wrappings, these are only specific to women. So when we go through our coming of age ceremony, that's usually when you're able to receive your wraps or like start wearing your moccasins with wraps. Um, and of course, there's a lot of stories and symbolism and meaning behind, you see even the color of our moccasins, the fact that these are red, there's a meaning behind that. Every single piece has a story and has a meaning. Um, but they're like super comfortable. I actually like, would much rather wear my moccasins than regular shoes because they really mold to your feet and it's just really soft. Um, but yeah, and typically back then when it was winter time, not only would you have your wraps, but they would also get like cloths or just sort of different plants and they would stuff it um, where their calves were underneath the wraps. And so that just also helped to protect against the cold environment as well. So yeah, and then we also have our sash belt too. So this is another example of like a, a weaving as well. And this is also used in different ceremonies as well as in childbirth too. So typically after a woman gave birth to sort of kind of like keep everything in as you're healing, that's when you wear a sash belt. And also when you're giving birth too, uh, it's incorporated into the ceremony. Yes. Use the mic. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, I was gonna say like about the shoes because you guys say you guys like you guys usually make things like on your own or, or stuff. I was gonna ask if like those are made like like how you guys make them, like, you know? Oh, how do you make them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like I understand you guys make it out of like this stuff, but just like how do you guys piece it? All right, perfect. So the question was asking about my moccasins and how we make them, which actually is good. Yeah, every single piece is like handmade because you can't really, can't really go to the store and buy these. Um, but to give an idea, these moccasins that I purchased, they're about like around $300, a little over $300 because everything is handmade. Yeah. So, but as far as the materials you can get, you know, you can go to the store. But as far as how moccasins are made, usually you start with the sole of the foot. So you'll get, yeah, just like really thick hide and you will cut that to your foot. Or at least they'll have like, a, like an average foot and they'll cut it to, to fit that. And then after that, I know that they sew this red leather into the inside, so then they add that part next. And then finally at the very end, um, if you can kind of see right here, the stitching, then we add um, the white leather part on which all of this is just one piece so it starts with like, I'm trying to think, it starts right here and it's this big and it's just this huge piece. And then after that, it's just sort of, uh, they cut it to this sort of smaller strap. So as I like wrap it around, it fully covers my calf. And then once it gets smaller to this size, then I just like wrap it up my leg, if that makes sense. It's a bit hard to understand if you haven't seen it, but, um, yeah, there's pretty much just three different parts to it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I know some students need to go to class, so feel free to go ahead and exit if you need to. But if you want to stay and take a picture with Emily, we can go ahead and do that with those of you who can stay. So thank you all for coming, and thank you so much for giving up your valuable time to share your talent and all of the knowledge that you shared with us today.